Good morning. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn over to Matthew this morning. Matthew chapter 24. And we're going to read from the Lord's sermon or his discourse on the Mount of Olives, the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24. And I want to read verses 1 through 8. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and I will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, and that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. If you would turn back to Daniel, and we want to look at verse uh, chapter 9, and we'll read from uh, chapter 9 there. So let's get over there. And I want to pick it up in verse 24 through 27. This has to do with the 70th week of Daniel. Seventy weeks have been decreed, been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in every everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary and its end will come with a flood, even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction one that is decreed is poured out on the, on the one who makes desolate. Then go over to Revelation, our text for this morning. Revelation chapter 6, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8 this morning together. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals... And I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth and that men would slay one another and a great sword was given to him. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. I looked and behold, a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand 
And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not damage the oil uh, and the wine. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, an ashen horse. And he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by, by the wild beasts of the earth. Rhodes, in his little uh, book on prophecy, he, he made this statement, and it's really good. He said, Scripture reveals that tribulation, that the tribulation period will be characterized by wrath. Zephaniah 1, 15 through 18. Judgment. Revelation 14, 7. Indignation. Isaiah 26, 20 through 21. By trial. Revelation 3, 10. By trouble, Jeremiah 37. By destruction, Joel 1.15. By darkness, Amos 5.18. By desolation, Daniel 9.27. By overturning, Isaiah 24, 1-4. And punishment, Isaiah 24, 20-21. Then he says, simply put, no passage of Scripture can be found to alleviate to any degree whatsoever the severity of this time that shall come upon this earth. There isn't any passage that paints a pretty picture of the tribulation. It is a time of the outpouring of divine wrath. It is the day of the wrath of the Lord. It is also identified in Revelation chapter 6 here as the day of the wrath of the Lamb. We have to face this reality. It is a truly terrifying time that is to be experienced by those who have not come into the church so as to be snatched up and to be spared this hour of trial and testing, this, this tribulation period. We, as we've looked at already, the church are safe at home. And we are out of harm's way. And every one of us should be saying, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. From your terrible wrath, which is just and righteous upon a world that has rejected you. It's a terrible time, but we've been spared. This period, this period is a part, and I want you to get this. This period, the seven year period of tribulation is a part of the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the theme of this book. That is the divine theme of this book. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So you need to understand that this seven years, as terrible as it is, is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It is an uncovering, an unveiling of Jesus. And in this regard, to a Christ-rejecting world, they are going to see him in, in all his movement. They're going to see God and they're going to know it's him. He's going to be unveiled. But he is being revealed in this particular portion as he is, as he is the only true, which we looked at in chapter 5, the only true kinsman redeemer worthy and able to wield omnipotent power in order to take back this earth 
He is going to take back this universe. He's going to take it back and he is going to establish his will and his reign for 1,000 years on this earth. And you know what else you should be saying right now? Praise God. We're going back to Genesis. It's going to be the way it should have been. Thank you, Lord. We get to see it. We get to watch the lion walk with the lamb. We get to walk with Jesus and, and, and be a part of serving him and, 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 and seeing his will done in all things. He's going to bring about his will. This morning, where we're at is we start and we take the first steps in that process. That's what's happening here. I used to be terrified of the book of Revelation. I am not kidding you. When I was a teenager, I had nightmares. I mean, I'd wake up in a cold sweat, and I'm a kid. Because I was scared to death of this time. It terrified me. Everything about it terrified me. This tribulation period, I wanted no part of it, and I was convinced I'm going into that thing. I knew that something had to change for me not to experience that. And praise God, by His grace, He brought me to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and I'm not going through it. I'm saved. And I'm not appointed unto wrath, nor is anyone who's trusted Jesus Christ, but to obtain salvation through Him, through Jesus. And praise God, I don't have to go through that, nor does anyone else if they trust the Lord. But we're going to take the first steps in the process of, of this earth being taken back by Jesus and his will and his reign being established. And it starts with the breaking of the seals. The seals, the seven seals on this one scroll, which we have determined is title deed in a simple form of this planet. It is that document that testifies to the reality that the kinsman redeemer, that is Jesus, who became flesh so that he's related to all mankind, and he is my kinsman, he went and paid that price by his blood. And that document says he, is the, he and only he is the one. That's why only he could walk up and take that scroll. That's how powerful that is. And we're going to see the first steps toward his wielding and exercising that power to take this earth back. Today we'll look at four. We're going to look at four of the seal judgments. These are often referred to as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The four horsemen of the apocalypse. So let's go right ahead. We'll jump in here and we'll look at this. Now, as, I hope we can just move right through it because you would think we could. But I'm telling you, when I get into this stuff and I start looking at all this stuff, there's just so many things you're chasing around to find out what's what and who's who and, and what's being set forth here and this and that. But it, it, it's, it's tremendous. It's scary, but, we, but you do not have to be afraid. What we should look at when we see this is it's Jesus taking this earth back unto himself. He's taking it back. He's, he's coming to establish his millennial reign. And we, the overcomers in Jesus Christ, will reign with him. We will share in that reign with our Lord Jesus. So we shouldn't look at this and, and just, oh, I hate what this is all about. Because it's revealing that he is God. And that he has to react as he reacts to a world that is opposed to him and rejects him and rejects God, oh, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So let's go ahead. The first seal is verses 1 and 2. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with the voice of thunder, Come, I looked, and behold... A white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So the first seal, verses 1 and 2, is the rider on the, 
a white horse. The rider on a white horse. Now, we need to come up to speed because we've been, what, two weeks or four weeks since we actually were in the throne room. And so I just want to come up to speed real briefly here with this. John, we know at this point, has been transported to the very throne room of God in glory. He's in heaven. He's where God is. God's allowed him to look into this throne room and witness this, this, this throne room. He has so far witnessed the activities surrounding the throne with the four living creatures. He's also uh, witnessed the persons, the father on the throne, the, the spirit represented by the seven torches. And he's witnessed the Lamb of God, who is the, the second person, the one triune God, who is his Jesus, our Jesus, and our Savior. He sees all three of them here in the throne. He sees the myriads of angels. He hears their voices. He hears the, 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 the saints around the throne, the 24 elders. All of this is being experienced by him. And we know how dramatic the scene was when no one was able to come and take that scroll because everybody spotted the scroll. And there's, there's a scroll in the Father's right hand. And who is worthy? No one could come. In earth, heaven, under the earth, there was no one worthy. And one steps forward, and it's our Jesus, the Lamb as though slain, who's paid the price. And it's perfect, and it makes him who he is and who's worthy. And he went up and he took the scroll. That's where we've been. Now, John, John, he sees this and he watches now. you got to put yourself in John's shoes. He's been a disciple. He was one of the disciples. <laughs> this is his Jesus. He's all our Jesus. But he, he sat under him for three years. He's the one who laid his head on his bosom. And, and he, he's the one, I'm the, he said of himself, I'm the one, Jesus, that, that he loved me. He loved me. And he had that relationship. And he's watching this. And Jesus now, he watches as he breaks the first seal. It's a powerful, powerful moment. And what he does is he's setting in motion the tribulation period and the fulfillment of, of all of the tribulation's purposes, what the tribulation is meant to uh, accomplish, a judgment upon earth dwellers, those who refuse, who spit in the face of the gospel and the person of Jesus Christ, and they're going to reject him. Although all hell's breaking around them, they still reject him. It's judgment. They're going through a, a time of judgment. There's a judgment or a purging taking place of the people of Israel. The program of the church is done. We are the after these things. We're already there. We're not down here. And the program is swung to Israel. He's got to bring it forward and through the tribulation, believing Jews, believing Israel, not by uh, proselytization, not by being spiritually grafted in, but Jewish lineage, biologically, that go back to the 12 tribes. He's got to bring them through so that they can inherit those promises. So judgment, purging, revelation is occurring through the tribulation. Jesus is being uh, seen. It's going to be clear who he is. He is the son of God. He is the savior. He is the second person of the one triune God. And every knee is going to come. Every, every person is going to come to that conclusion at the end of this tribulation. That's going to be the reality. Everybody's going to know this. We're going to know that. And then also he's establishing through this process, his, he's bringing this earth to the place he can set up his uh, millennial reign. So now, as Jesus breaks the first seal, John says, one of the living ones, and I love these guys. I already told you that. I don't know what they are. We, I believe they're cherubim, but I don't really care. I just love them because they're, they're always loving God. They're always holy, holy. They're all about what he's about, and, and they're into it. They're there, and they, they do his will, and they, they're, they're attached to the end times program of God. And one of these living ones with the voice of, 
And I love this, with the voice of thunder. What's thunder? Be comes before the storm. And John says that when he yells out, and he it's like a crack of thunder indicating it's getting ready to happen. It's happening. And he says, he cries out, come, come. So he issues a command. He issues a command. Now the King James Version, if you have that, uh, I'm sorry. No, not really. It's a good translation. But it indicates that it's an invitation to John to come and witness what's, what's unfolding. What's happening is this, this living one, by the authority of he who's on the throne, is issuing a command to the horsemen. Come. The seal is broken. Come forth. In, in your role, in this unfolding of this program, this end times program. So John, he's witnessing all of this. And this horseman, this rider on this horse is summoned. What John sees, we're told, is what he sees. And he's like, behold, a white horse. Now, you can read the best commentaries. I've read many of them myself. And are there, is there going to be horses in glory? There is. Praise God. I love them. I've always loved horses. I'm thankful for it. And uh, they're going to be there. But how this plays out around the throne and with the seal, it seems to be symbolic. But I don't, ha I don't uh, have any doubts that what John saw was a rider on a white horse. He, was, he saw that. Uh, J. Vernon McGee said this is the first movie or television in the history because John is actually watching like a, this is all unfolding. But it seems that the horses are symbolic. There probably was a rider that he, he sees. But it seems like it's symbolic language. But he sees a, a, a rider on a white horse. He also notes that that rider has a bow. It says he has a bow, not a bow in his hair. He has a bow bow okay a bow and he also has a crown did you hear that a crown upon his head and it says that he went out conquering and to conquer so that's what john sees and that's what we're told this white horse is coming out the first seal being broken this is the first part of the judgment now what does all this indicate and more importantly, we need to answer the question, who is on the horse? What is, this, what is this white horse and the rider on the white horse? And we're going to try to answer this uh, question. Who is the rider on this white horse? Now, I want to say this. Jewish tradition, not as it relates to this revelation, okay? Not, a, not as it relates to Revelation 6, but Jewish tra tradition always sees or saw, sees Messiah on a white horse, on a charger. He's the one in their mindset who comes on a white charger to right all the wrongs of this world and every, every injustice that's ever been experienced by the people, his people, Israel. That, they've always seen him on a white horse. Revelation 19 at the, end of, uh, at the end of the tribulation, before the establishment of the millennial reign, and we, we're, we see Jesus come blazing out of glory, and he's seated on a white horse. So that vision that it, the Jews have of him is really accurate, because in the end, he is everything that they thought he would be. The only problem was is they didn't label the right guy at the right time. They should have been able to pick up on this when he was here. They missed it. Praise God, because we, we've been allowed in. But the reality is, is he does come out of heaven on a white horse. And by the way, we may get ride right alongside of him. And that'll be cool. But anyway, also, the white horse always seems uh, in, in the cultures of the time, and, and not just... Uh, 
Bible culture, but just cultures in general, always speak, uh, uh, have, have a symbolism of uh, conquest and victory. Uh, the, the white horse, the riding in, the procession, like in Rome, you come in and, and it, it, ideally it would be on a white horse because it speaks of victory. You're victory, you're a conqueror, that kind of, that kind of thing. Also, uh, I want to say this, Wearsby, uh, I looked for, you know, why the horses, and it seems like the reason that we have the pictures of the horses, or the horses are what John sees, horses uh, represent God's activity on earth. It, it, it's associated, when we see horses, it speaks toward his activity on earth, or the forces that he would utilize to accomplish his purposes. We, there's there, horses figure in that equation in language and in, 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 in the unfolding of that as it's written. But again, here's the question. This is where we want to get to. Who is this guy on the horse? That has to be addressed, okay? That's what we need to get today anyway. There are two primary views. There, there are several, but there are two that really, uh, that, that are pretty much most people land on, these, these two. The first one is that it's Jesus that's on the white horse. And the white horse and Jesus on it represent the proclamation and the victory of the gospel. And the ultimate victory. It's, it's a symbolism where we see Jesus on the white horse. And by the way, I believe John saw a rider on a white horse. The second position is this this rider on the white horse is the ultimate false messiah. Well, who, who, just say it, Pastor. Well, who is it? It's the Antichrist. The rider on the white horse is viewed secondly, second position, and really the, it is the most predominant position of people of our, of, of our ilk, pre-mill, pre-trib type. But that has nothing to do with why they take that. But anyway, it's, it's the Antichrist. Now, how, why, why, why would we say that? Well, this is, by the way, the position I would hold. I think it's the most uh, plausible position, and I'm going to give you reasons in a moment here. But uh, Matthew 24 opens with, there will be in that time, and he's talking about the signs, Jesus is, I read it to you, the Olivet Discourse, he said that the signs, one of the signs is going to be false messiahs that will come with all kinds of claiming to be the Christ, claiming to be uh, the false, you know, be the Messiah. That will be one of those early on uh, signs of, of that day. Also, Daniel 9, 26, which I read, told us that there will be the prince who is to come. There is that be that 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 personality who will come forth at the very beginning, at the beginning of the tribulation period. Both those texts testify that those are realities, that there will be the false these false Christ. But the, but in Daniel we're told it's a specific personality, and he's referred to as the prince who is to come. Now here's some of the reasons why. Uh, I believe that this is the Antichrist and this position is the most plausible. This is the one that, that, that I think is right. And it has to do, some of it, has to do with the differences between chapter 19 and Jesus on the white horse at the second coming and this rider on the white horse at the beginning of the tribulation, which is the first seal being broken. Okay, so there's differences, and I'm going to give you those. In Revelation 6, what we, where, where we're at, he's seen with what in it? He has, a, he has a bow. He has a bow. At the second coming, when Jesus comes on the white horse at the second coming, he comes with a sword in 19, chapter 19, 15. So he comes with a sword. That's one difference. Two, the rider and the horse in in. Uh, at the first seal on that white horse has a crown, one crown. The rider, uh, Jesus, on the, on the white charger coming out of heaven at the second coming, 
to establish his millennial reign has many crowns. It says he has many crowns. Third, the crown upon the head of the one on the white horse in, in, in the first seal is a Stephanos. Is, it, is the, it is the overcomer's crown or the victor's crown, a victor, crown of victory. The crown upon the many crowns on Jesus' head when he comes with the white charger in, 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 in at the end is that they are diadems, a totally different term. And a diadem is the crown of royalty, of actual lineage, of, of who identify the reality. It's not something you gain or earn. It's based upon who you are. And he is royalty. Fourth, the writer in Revelation is coming at the beginning of the tribulation. When? Actually, the very first seal of the, revel, of, of, excuse me, of the tribulation. The very first seal being broken, this white horse and rider come forth. Jesus on the charge of the white horse, where we know it's Jesus, is at the end of the tribulation. Now I want to point out one other thing real quick. I got two, two, three more here to get to, but I want to say this before it escapes my mind. Why identify clearly that it's Jesus over here, and if this is book is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the unveiling, why in the world wouldn't you tell us this is Jesus? We're told that he's the lamb as though slain. We, we weren't told it was Jesus then, but we were given enough evidence to where we know exactly what that's referring to. It had to do with his redeeming work as the lamb. As the Lamb of humanity who went and he was the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Let's go on though. Five, proof five. One of the living ones issues a command to the writer. No one commands Jesus. He's God. And not even those good boys, those living ones, those, one, those great fellas have the right nor the authority to say, come to Jesus. So that's a problem. Six, Jesus is the one breaking the seal. And he's the one now riding a horse out of here in the, in the image uh, imagery. It's just not logical. And then seven, would be the, the parallels that are clear with Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, the early part of the tribulation, there are false Christs. That, that's the very first thing that's mentioned. This one who comes forth, conquering and to conquer, is the Antichrist. He will come on the scene and be on the scene at the very outset of the tribulation. His personality, he'll be, on, he'll be in a position where he will be on the rise. Why, why do I say that? Because he's conquering and it, he comes to conquer. Now I want you to notice something because there's something very significant here. We are told that this entrance of the Antichrist who comes conquering and to conquer, when we look at it, he, we're see, he's seen with a bow. It's important that it doesn't mention arrows. There's no mention of arrows. Now, is this reading in? It is. I'm just going to be honest with you. This is mere speculation, but it's, but it's uh, what we would call an educated speculation from other texts. This seems to indicate, which we know to be the reality from other texts, that this Antichrist, when he comes initially as a world leader and, and in his world governance, in the early phases of his power, it will be accomplished without warfare. Because the bow has no arrows, but it is a military weapon. So he is militarily mighty, but yet he doesn't have to wield that at this point 
to gain the victory and the status as a conqueror and conquering. We do know this from other texts that he will be an instrument for peace initially. It's part of his falsehood. He, he, he offers peace as the bait to get the world to, to bite and to, 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 to laud him and elevate him and hold him up for, for, for that, that accomplishment. We also know that he will make a covenant with Israel in the beginning. He will have, in some way, he will make a covenant whereby he will provide peace. Because the Thessalonians, it says at that point in time, they are all saying peace and what? Safety. And then, what? Sudden destruction comes upon them. So the early part is a time of peace and safety. Well, this one who comes, he comes with a bow, but he doesn't have any arrows. What's that all about? He's riding a white horse, the horse of a victor. A conqueror. That's exactly how this false Messiah comes. This one. The ultimate one. The Antichrist. He also has the crown on his head. Which speaks of his... Uh, he has a position of authority. But, but make no mistake about the purpose of this rider on the white horse. He comes forth to do what? Con conquering... And to conquer. His entire purpose is total domination. He, he is out to rule this globe. By the way, that's exactly what Satan has wanted from day one. When he fell, what did he say? What was the cause of his fall? What was his claim? His claim was the five I wills. And all of them had to do with ascending to the very throne of God. I will be God. The only problem is he's not a creator. So what did he have to do to be God? He has to take it. He has to usurp God. And that's what he tried to do. And he's still going to try in the end. He's going to try and dominate this entire globe. He's going to try and rule it. I want you to note one important point here right at the outset, and you're going to see it throughout the un, uh, as each seal is broken. You don't want to miss this because then you get lost in all of the terrible things that are occurring, and you start looking at this in a wrong way, and you don't see God properly. You, you start to look at how can he be so harsh? How can this happen? You know, that's not who he is. That's not who he is to me. Well, it isn't who he is to me, but it is who he is. And that is, is he has to violently and decisively act to the, uh, against that which is against him and opposes him in wickedness and sinfulness. And, he, and he's going to do that. But I want you to note this point. The events that are unfolding here are by the sovereign direction of God himself of Jesus he's breaking the seals those angels who represent and are around the throne of God they do the will of the father they're they're all commanding this to come forth so it's not this isn't like just hey, cutting Satan loose and saying have at it no he's got a purpose in every bit of this and it will happen just as he lets it happen and, and, and it will accomplish, in the end, his ultimate glorification. It will. Uh, he's glorified even through this horrible judgment. Let's go to seal number two. These will be faster. Seal number two, verses three and four. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creatures saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men should slay one another, and, and, and a great sword was given to him. Seal number two is the rider on the red horse. Red is the color of uh, fire, blood. Uh, it, it, it speaks of war. That's the color. Uh, and, and we get that interpretation right out of that passage because that's what he brings. 
Whatever peace this Antichrist was able to establish is short-lived. That's what we see. How do we know that? Well, we only got seven years, but right? We got seven years of tribulation. We got three and a half years are the beginning of birth pangs. Jesus said these are what you've just witnessed. This is just the beginning. And the rider on the red horse comes out within that first three and a half year period. He's brokered a peace somehow, probably in the process of doing so. And that's going to be what catapults him to this place. And then ultimately that peace that he has brokered and by military threat or other posturing caused to come about, it will fall apart. And this red horse is a picture of that. And he comes to take peace from the world, and he brings the sword. In Matthew 24, 6 and 7, we are told that in those early point after this leader comes on the scene, and, and that, that he comes by way of this bow without arrows, he's riding a white horse, he's got the crown, you know, everybody's like, oh, he's wonderful, and he's riding the white horse, then it's all going to fall apart. And in Jesus' discourse on this very time frame, he says there will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be nation rising against nation and kingdoms against kingdoms. So it's going to fall apart in a big way and people are going to be fighting wars. And, and, and what the ones that aren't fighting are going to be posturing like they're ready to go. And it's, the whole world is going to feel like it's a boiling cauldron ready to blow. And, and it is. It really is. So that's what the red horse is. Third seal. Five and six. When he broke the third seal, I heard the living creature, the third living creature, saying, Come. I looked and behold a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. So what are we dealing with here? This is seal three. We have a black horse. We've had a white horse. We've had the red horse of war. Now we have the black horse of famine. Black represents the famine. It's, it's the famine. This rider on the black horse, we're told he has a pair of scales. Well, what are we talking about? What we're talking about, if this is about famine, which it is, because he tells us that the supplies are so decreased that the cost for one person's requirement for one day of food, which is a quart of, of wheat, is a day's wage. It's 12 times higher than what it originally would have been. You, you, for the same denarius, you would have been able to buy 12 people's day's ration. But in this moment the, 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 a famine, it will cost you 12 times more to just get the one portion. Just for one person to live. Just one. Just one. And so the scales represent what? Rationing. You're, it's weighed out. Each, you're going to get what you get, and that's all you're getting. You're not, you're not walking down to Walmart in this day. You're not landing at Aldi's on this day. You're not, hit, you're not driving over here to Kroger or walking across over here to Dollar General on this day. You're not doing it. It's going to, be, it's going to cost 12 times the amount at the very least just to, just to get enough to live on one person a day's ration. A day's ration. You know how many people are going to be able to afford to do that? The ones who say, do not damage the oil and the wine. That's what that phrase is all about. I always wondered about that. And it seems like that the indication has to do with the, those elements that the wealthy were able to have. They were always able to have the oil. It spoke of wealth and affluence. And the wine speaks of, of wine. It seems to be that even in this time frame, that somehow or another... The wealthy are able to exist without little uh, consequence per se. They think. They think. Even in the midst of all of it. It's, it's, the, it's the ones who do not have that are going to suffer the greatest. Because how do you afford it? It starts explaining a lot of other things we're going to see. How people give, brother gives up brother. 
You know, it's about survival. It's, it's, it's going to be a very, very difficult situation. The last seal. The last seal. I think I hit on what I wanted to hit on. Yes. Okay, last seal. Seal four. Seven and eight. This is the pale horse or the ashen horse. When the lamb broke the fourth seal... I heard the voice of the, four living cre the fourth living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him. The, the place of the dead. Those, those, the, 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 this isn't Abraham's bosom. This is the place the people are, are awaiting the white throne judgment. And, and death, basically, it's, it, he's riding the horse and this is where they're going. Authority was given to him, to them, I say, over, and I, I believe that them has to do with the consequences, which you'll see in a moment. To, was get, let me just read, finish reading and then I'll make my statement here. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with famine, and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. These are the things that follow within the, in the wake of war on, on, the, on this level that we have. So we have this fourth rider is death. He's on a pale horse. Some people think that that is a uh, uh, ashen horse that has a green hue that they throw green in there. I've never seen a green horse in my life unless he was rolling in something I wish he had. Enough. But I have seen ashen horses. I've seen gray ones. And uh, I've seen them. And, and that, that's what we're talking about, that gray. They, sometimes they get a look about them just depending on how the light hits them to where they give a color. And, and it speaks of of uh, death, dying. That, that uh, You've heard people, they looked ashen. They looked pale. They looked so pale. That's what we're talking about. The rider on the pale horse is given authority over a quarter of the earth's population. I did a little research on this for us. 2018, the population of the earth, if you take the 2018 population, of 70 billion people or something like along that line. What is it? Seven. seven billion, excuse me, seven billion. It is seven billion. Seven billion. I didn't have that figure wrote down. Seven billion. But here's what would it be if you took a quarter of that. Just a quarter. One billion, nine hundred and forty-three million, nine hundred and sixty-nine thousand, three hundred and forty-two point two five people are dead. That's a mind blower. Two billion, right at two billion people. Gone in the first part of the tribulation. The first part of the tribulation. How does it come about? How do they kill so many? How does this happen? We're told they kill by means of the sword, which is war. Wars, rumors of wars, nation against nation, kingdoms against kingdom, martyrdom. They kill by famine, what we're looking at, what we just looked at. They kill by pestilence, which is disease. When you have death on that magnitude, where you're not able to process or deal rightly with I don't know. It, you've got all kinds of uh, disposal of the bodies. You've got all kinds of disease and pestilence that kicks in. Then it says wild beasts. Now, what is that? <laughs> That's one of those fun facts that you're like, what, is, what wild beasts? Uh, and and you, you have to ask what we're dealing with here. And there's, there's several ideas, and, and I'm going to throw three at you that I've come across. One is that they actually believe it could be that wild beasts are actually killing people. Uh, do, you know, and you think about it, it's, it's possible. You know, it's possible that when all, everything's falling apart, that, that the, you know, they, the, the, the 
food supplies are going to be disrupted and all of those things and, and the, 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 the way it all is connected and they've got to eat, they kill people. That's one. Another one is, is that the wild beast, and due to the term that's used there, this seems to be the most likely because this term is actually used multiple times in Revelation and has to do with military and political powers. Uh, they're killed by the, their authority and, and by them personally. And then one guy, he's a commentator, and he, he says that they're definitely, an, he sees it as an animal, uh, that it's a reference to an, an animal, and he sees it, he said, what about the rat? And I'm like, who's going to say it's rats? Because that's my worst nightmare right there anyway. But uh, rats. And he, and he went on to explain something about, about the whole deal. And, uh, and it's just mere speculation, you know, but it's wild beast. But he made this point. More people have been killed by rats as a, as a sidebar of rats, the existence of rats, the pestilence of rats, the vermin rat. For you have pet rats. They're rats. They've killed more people than all the wars combined. They carry 35 diseases. And you just imagine when you have 2 billion people of your population killed in this, this early part of the tribulation. I don't think we can fathom that. Even in World War II, they, when, they were, when they were planning for genocide, the Germans. They had terrible, the, one of the big issues was disposing of the bodies. Getting rid of what the, these people they were murdering and, and killing. Well, with, the, with, the, with that all happening, you can see how you could get pestilence. It says pestilence is a part of this. Now here's where I land on all of it. It's most likely number two. It's all a result of the military powers and the political powers, the beast and all of his mechanizations, uh, his planning to get rid of, you know, to just butcher and kill and maim and do what he's going to do. But it's probably, likely, it's all of the above. On some level, they probably all could factor into that because he doesn't name just one thing. He says it's wars. It's famine, it's pestilence, and it's wild beasts. So it sounds to me like it's just going to be a time of death. Great death will, will hit this planet, this earth, during this early part of the tribulation. Now I want to conclude with this. You think on this. Jesus in Matthew 24 after he said what he said, and after we've looked at what we've looked at, because it seems like the first four seals are definitely land within the first part of the tribulation. You can make a case that the martyring could be more toward mid, right in the middle, and, and right, at, right shortly after the middle. But, but I think that it's probably going to go on the whole time. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to be under, you know, he's going to be putting on the face of, you know, I, I'm the protector and all this, the beast, but behind, he hates believers. He hates the people of God. And so he could be martyring all the way through because there's a great number around the throne. We're going to see that in the next one. But I want you to think on this. Jesus said this, and keep this in mind. He said, this is only the beginning of birth pangs. This world has never seen what's going to happen during the seven years. We've never seen anything like it. As horrible as we've seen things, and we've seen some horrible things, we've never seen what's going to happen, what's going to unfold on this earth. It just gets even, it's going to get worse and worse and worse to where man, literally, God says, if he did not cut the day short, there'd be nobody to rescue that's how horrible it is. Now, I'm going to throw this at you. If you're, if you're an unbeliever today and you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, you know, they say you shouldn't scare people into heaven. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, 
Revelation scared me so bad, that's where I wanted to be. <laughs> God used that in a very powerful way in my life to, to look to Him and to understand I do not want to experience that wrath because I knew I deserved it. I knew that without Him, I deserve anything I could get. And I did. That was young. You need Jesus. If you haven't trusted Christ, the only escape is by faith in Jesus Christ. But we don't do it just to escape. We do it because we recognize we're lost without Him. And that He paid a price that we could never pay to save us. And He says, all He says to us is believe in me. Trust in what I did and I will save you. And we know from the other passages that that saves me not only from eternal fire, but from the wrath of the Lamb even in the tribulation. And the eternal fire is far worse than even the tribulation period. For us as believers, this should cause us to draw near to the Lord. That's what revelation should do for us. We're not going to go through that time, but what we ought to realize is it is going to happen. He is coming back, and we are going to, we are going to face him. As his children, we're going to account for our time. And so it should move us in a direction of purity and, as our theme stated, anticipation of his return where we can say with John, even so, come Lord Jesus. That should be our hearts. That should be where we end up. Is Lord, we love you and we thank you for loving us and we say, come Lord. Come Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for our time and your word today. We pray you bless as uh, we, we've sat under it. I pray that the knowledge of it would, would help us to understand who you are and how your judgments are fierce and terrifying, yet your grace is uh, unlimited, Lord, in, in the sense that, that you provided a way that we don't have to experience this. And I, I, just, I just pray that those, those folks here, anyone here that hasn't trusted you, young or old, that you would bring them this, this day and at this moment to the saving knowledge of Christ, Lord. Cause them to, if they need to be, talk about it, to ask me or to ask their, their parents or, or one another, uh, find out and, and get further uh, clarification that they might come to the saving knowledge of Christ. But cause us as believers to want to walk with you in a way, Lord, that uh, truly shines the light upon Jesus Christ and what it is to be a Christian. Bless each one for being out today. Bless any time of fellowship that we might have one with another this, this afternoon. And I ask as uh, the uh, Kids Club kicks off tonight, Lord, you'd be in every part of that, that it'd be a great time, well attended. And uh, just bless the leaders, Lord, in this year ahead. Help them impact these long, young lives for you. And we just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.